Razer has released a new non-gaming laptop, and this is the Razer Book 13. And so of course I thought, let's go ahead and just compare this new laptop to Apple's new M1 MacBook Pro and see which one might be the better purchase. Now, of course, none of this is going to really matter if you're already heavily invested in one platform. If you prefer Windows or Mac OS, uh, then obviously just go ahead and pick up the machine that goes with the operating system that you like to use. But for those who want a new laptop, maybe you don't know what direction you want to go in or what exactly you're looking for, then hopefully this video will help you decide which one of these two machines you might want to pick up. So at first glance, these two machines look incredibly similar to each other. Razer clearly borrowed a few design cues from Apple, but there are also a few things that I really like about the Razer Book and its design that I think Apple should implement into future MacBooks too. For starters, this near bezel-less design, I mean, look at this thing. When you turn it on, it's pretty cool to look at. There's really not a whole lot of bezels going on at all, and it's really modern and sleek. Now, there is a small strip of bezel at the top, just enough to fit the webcam for your video conference calls that you might wanna do, uh, but that's really it. The display itself isn't bad either, but it's also a matte display, and I'm not exactly sure how I feel about it. At times, it's actually really beneficial to have a matte display because there's less glare and reflection and viewing angles is really good from pretty much all aspects. But then you look at the MacBook's Retina display and it's very high quality glossy panel and it just looks so much better sometimes compared to this matte display that uh, I think I'm just gonna have to kind of go with the MacBook Pro's display. The keyboard area is similar to that of the MacBook Pro. There are speaker grills on both sides of the keyboard and the speakers sound really, really good on each computer so you're not going to miss out on that department. Each machine also has relatively large trackpads, though if you really look at it and compare them side by side, the MacBook makes the Razorbook's trackpad look relatively pedestrian because this trackpad is just gigantic. I'm not a fan of the physical clicking trackpad these days. It's not a bad one by any means, but the haptic trackpad on the Mac that mimics a button press has spoiled me. It just feels so much better and being able to click anywhere on the trackpad rather than finding specific zones is just something that I can't get over and really prefer this over any other trackpad. But again, there's really nothing wrong with the trackpad on the Razer. I just prefer this one. Keys feel great to type on as well. There's not a whole lot of key travel on either one of these machines, but the keyboards are responsive and I like them. Apple had a lot of issues with the keyboard in the past, but they've seemingly fixed that and things have been a lot better these days. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with this keyboard, at least as far as I know in my limited testing. Um, everything has been really, really good in terms of typing experience on the Razer Book 13. Now the MacBook Pro does have a touch bar, which I don't use and I don't really see the point these days. I wish they would just kind of do away with it and give us better function keys, I don't know. But the Razer doesn't have anything like that. It's just traditional function row uh, and you can do everything that you need to do with it. The Razer Book does offer RGB keys, which is one of those features like the touch bar that is cool for like two minutes and then you realize you're never gonna probably actively need this and so you just kind of turn it off. I also wanna point out a couple of other design elements like this little lip here at the front of the laptop and the fans. Now, starting with the lip, this is meant for people to easily kind of place one finger underneath and lift up on the lid and be able to just use your computer that way. It's really easy to do on the MacBook Pro, but not so much with the Razer Book. They kind of made the lip and the front edge of each, uh, you know, part, the top and the bottom kind of flush. So it's really hard to distinguish where that lip is at and to get a good grasp with your finger. And, and that's just not the case with the MacBook Pro. And that's not a reason or a huge deal at all to go out and buy one machine over the other, but it's just a little gripe that I found that I wanted to point out. And then the fans at the bottom of the Razer Book is an interesting move to me. I guess this is just nothing out of the ordinary or anything crazy. I think a lot of manufacturers that aren't named Apple do this, but I've always just used a MacBook in my life. I mean, I've used other Windows PCs uh, or other Windows laptops, but it's just not something that I use full time. And I'm so, I'm just not used to having fans at the bottom of the machine. Uh, and when you actually use this 
you know, Razorbook as an actual laptop on your lap, you are covering some of the airflow and those fans, and so things could get kind of hot. With the MacBook Pro, there are no fans at the bottom, but instead, everything flows through the hinge area. And in years past, this would actually still cause your lap to get pretty hot, and the fans are extremely loud, but this new M1 MacBook Pro has been incredible with thermal management and power efficiency, and even though there are fans on this machine, both of the machines, they rarely ever kick on with the M1 MacBook Pro. In fact, I've never heard the fans kick on, and it's been over a month since we've been using this MacBook Pro. Also, uh, things have hardly been hot to the touch. And what I mean by that is this metal part here in between the MacBook Pro um, kind of text here and this aluminum here from the bottom and the top, that's where the fan is at or where you know thermal management happens. Uh, and this is the area that traditionally in years past would get extremely hot when you start doing tasks that you know, require more horsepower per se. And yeah, it doesn't get hot. It gets warm sometimes, but it rarely ever gets hot to the touch. Now, one last thing I do wanna point on, one last thing that absolutely Apple needs to just do in the future. Unfortunately, I don't think they're going to do this. It's a no brainer in terms of ports, who wins? It's the Razorbook 13. There are more than three I.O. ports, and so that makes it an instant winner. The machine gives you two Thunderbolt 4 ports, one on each side, and a 3.5 millimeter audio port. And just by naming those three things, that's where we stop on the MacBook Pro. That's all you get. Two Thunderbolt 4 ports and a 3.5 millimeter audio port. But then on the Razorbook, you get those three as well as a USB type A, an HDMI and a micro SD card. But in terms of IO ports, clearly you get more options here. The more options is much better than having to carry around dongles for the MacBook Pro. One quick side note, the Razorbook is technically lighter and smaller than the MacBook Pro. Um, in terms of weight, they're both around three pounds. I think the MacBook Pro is at three pounds and this is like 2.95. So you're really not gonna notice a huge difference, but the footprint is significantly smaller uh, or at least significantly more noticeable on the Razorbook 13 because of that bezel-less design. And finally, the three most important categories that I'm going to touch on right now are price, uh, performance and battery life, not necessarily in that order. The Razorbook and the MacBook Pro, in theory, have similar specifications. They both have 256 gigs of SSD, uh, storage, eight gigabytes of RAM, and that's for the base model. These are both base models. But the biggest difference lies within the CPU and GPU. Apple is running an M1 chip its own custom silicon, while the Razorbook is running the new 11th generation Intel i5 processor and its own Intel Xe graphics. In terms of everyday use, I really haven't noticed anything that was crazy different with performance, but I do just feel like software-wise, Big Sur is just much smoother of an operating system and it integrates really well with the apps that I would tend to use on a Mac, primarily, and it might not be fair to the Razorbook, but I have to be honest, the apps that I mostly use are apps that Apple might have created themselves, so it makes sense that, you know, those apps work well. But again, like Safari is created by Apple and Microsoft Edge is obviously created by Microsoft. And when you compare these two, Windows with Microsoft Edge and Safari with Mac OS, I just feel like the experience is better with Mac OS and Safari than it has been with uh, Microsoft Edge on Windows. The real thing to note here is that if you were to need extra power for something like video or photo editing, coding, really anything that might be CPU or GPU intensive, the M1 has a little bit more capability and you will notice that when running a few benchmarks. You'll see there's a sizable difference in scores between the two single and multi-core scores as well as GPU scores. There's a very big difference here with the M1 MacBook Pro leading in just about all of the categories. It's not just about potential performance, but also how the machines handle the load of that added pressure coming from those more intensive tasks. It's been no secret on this channel and every video that we've done with the M1, how impressed I've been with the M1 Max efficiency. And I've still, again, have never heard the fans kick on when using this machine. And I've edited, I've edited a bunch of 4K videos and, and it's just, it's crazy that this thing never really kicks up the fans or has the need to because it's just not getting overwhelmed and getting too hot. In contrast, 
The Razer Book, the moment I turned on this machine and put in my information and logged in, it opened up Microsoft Edge and then unplugged it, the fans immediately kicked on. It just, it's crazy how quickly other machines need thermal help from the fans. Speaking of unplugging these machines, battery life on the Razer Book 13 has been pretty good. It's rated to last around nine hours or so, and I've actually been able to get a little bit more than that. Now, the MacBook Pro is rated for up to 20 hours, even with just a slightly bigger 56 watt hour battery compared to the Razer Book's 55 watt hour battery. Now, I don't think I've ever gotten 20 hours. That's just never happened, but it's definitely been a lot more than nine hours. And so that just kind of, again, points to the efficiency and how it manages tasks with the battery. And it's been good on both machines, but there's been a much clearer edge to the M1 MacBook Pro. And last but not least, pricing, which is something I can't give you an opinion on. These are just facts. And it's a fact that the Razorbook is actually $100 cheaper, coming in at $1199 over the base model M1 MacBook Pro that comes in at $1299. And while I do think that you're going to probably get the better machine by spending that extra $100, at least in terms of specs, performance, and capabilities, uh, you know, by going with the M1 MacBook Pro, I really don't think you're going to find a whole lot that you can't do on the Razorbook. It's a fine laptop that's capable of doing all of the tasks and functions that a lot of traditional laptops can do with a little bit more power in the tank for when you might need it. Just not nearly as much of that extra power than you would get on the M1 MacBook Pro. But of course, I would love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. Which machine do you like? Are you planning on looking at either one of these two? Go ahead and let me know down in those comments. And before we end today's video, I do wanna give you more information about today's sponsor, A-Logic. A-Logic has just released its new Ultra Power 4-in-1 wireless charging dock, and it's aimed to be the central charging solution for all of your wirelessly charged personal accessories. This charging dock features wireless charging for two Qi-enabled devices like your smartphone, your AirPods, etc., as well as a spot for your Apple Watch. And if you're wondering where the fourth device comes into play, uh, just check the back of the device as there is a USB type A port available to charge literally any device that you might want. And the best part to me is how this thing is laid out with the multi-coil array so that when you go and place your iPhone on the wireless charging dock, you don't have to fumble around to find the best spot. It's really easy to find that perfect spot to wirelessly charge your phone. And if you wanna know more information about a Logic and the 4-in-1 wireless charging dock, just go ahead and click the link in the description down below. This has been Dan with Mac Rumors. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you around in the next video.